Is everybody having a good time at AUSA so far? Well, it's our last day, so I know you're going to miss. You have to wait, uh, but you can set your clocks to 365 days till next year's annual meeting. Welcome to the Sergeant Major of the Army's annual initiative brief. This is personally one of my favorite briefs and the most watched, actually, of all briefs here at AUSA because we are going live to our non-commissioned officers and soldiers all across the Army via live streaming broadcast for this event. I am Dan Daly, Sergeant Major of the Army, retired. As a reminder, please turn off or silence your cell phones for this forum. Let me begin by welcoming our distinguished guests, beginning with our host, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. I want to say that to the end. <laughs> we have a number of distinguished uh, gentlemen here with us today. First, I'll start with the 13th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Ken Preston. Ooh. We have several, and ladies and gentlemen, this time more important than all, what's going on in our world today, that we stay aligned with our allies. Would you please stand for our international SMAs to please be recognized, please. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Your presence means so much to us. Thank you for being here today. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Director of the Army Emergency Relief, Lieutenant General Raymond Mason. Well, good morning, afternoon, I suppose. Check my clock there. Um, I've been the Director of AER for about seven years. I tell people it's the second best job I ever had in my life. The best was being a battalion commander in the 82nd. Pretty tough to beat that, but this is right behind it. Um, our motto is soldiers helping soldiers. That's what AUSA is about as well. It's about that great young man and woman that are out on freedom's frontier defending our nation. One of our axioms of AER is asking for help is a sign of strength. It's rather easy to say it's hard in practice, but that's what AER is committed to. I know that's what the non-commissioned officer corps is committed to. Uh, I just got back from two weeks in Germany on AER business. Uh, lots of great stuff happening. They're busy as heck. Obviously, I was at Grafenweir and, Grafenweir and stuff was blowing up left and right. But the biggest challenge that our soldiers and families are having right now in Europe is the price of utilities. It's going up by about 300 percent. And they're getting those bills kind of all at one time. AER can help with that. Getting ready to head to Korea uh, tomorrow morning, actually, for that, you know, 18-hour trip across the Pacific. And I look forward to being there in the land of the morning calm. Um, I do have to say that I learned a lot from my dad. He was a, started off as a private in World War II and did 30 years in the Army, retired as a colonel. And he told me two important things, along with a lot of other stuff. He said, take care of your soldiers, they'll take care of you. Absolutely true. Second thing he told me, which is perhaps equally important, is listen to your NCOs. They will guide you, they will train you. I certainly have found that throughout my career. I, uh, I, I, you know, as a commander, I had a Sergeant Major that was my right-hand battle buddy. I now have six Sergeant Majors at AER, retired Sergeant Majors, so it takes six to try to keep me squared away at this point in my life. But that's kind of where I am, but I'm blessed to have them, and you're blessed to have them as the, as the AER team. So thanks, Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinston. I appreciate it, you working us in here this morning. Um, he's on our board of, of managers, along with the Vice, other command Sergeant Majors, some in this room. AER is part of the Army. We're not some separate organization. Yeah, we're a nonprofit, but we're part of the Army. We're your official nonprofit. We are 100% focused on soldiers. Uh, I want to thank Dan Daly and AUSA, General Brown. Uh, AUSA donated a million dollars to AER this year to help with financial resiliency, helping soldiers as they work through all those challenges of life. Um, I want to congratulate all of our active duty campaign winners, and that's what we're here today to do, to recognize those. Hunter Army Airfield, Fort Leonard Wood, and Fort Jackson. The campaign we run every year is about informing soldiers. Our goal is 100% of all soldiers and hopefully Army families informed of the programs and benefits of AER. That's why we exist. And you had to give them an opportunity to donate. AER has been around 80 years, and in those 80 years, we were stood up by George C. Marshall, by the way, and he gave us a mission statement. His mission statement was help relieve financial distress on the force. That was true in 1942, and it is absolutely true in the year of our Lord, 2022. Same mission statement. 
Over those 80 years, about 4 million of your brothers and sisters have been helped by AER. Every year, we do about 40 to 50,000 soldiers and assistants to the tune of about $70 million. It's about 40 to 50 million in zero interest loans. Where else can you get a zero interest loan? I can't think of one. Or grants and scholarships for spouses. It's about spouse employment, as well as uh, college-bound children. Um, we are, again, as I said, 100% focused on soldiers. All those dollars that we provide came from, look to your left and your right, from you, from soldiers. You receive no money from the Army staff, no money from federal government. It all comes from great soldiers donating. Yes, we get some money from corporations and American citizens as well. 90 cents of every dollar that's donated goes right back to soldiers. That's in the top 1% of all the nonprofits in the United States, and we're very proud of that. And the Sergeant Major of the Army and the previous Sergeant Major of the Army keep us, keep our, you know, focused on that as they should. So why do we, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, that why do we exist? Why does AER do what we do? It's about combat readiness. It's about resiliency, helping you help your soldiers with resiliency. Let me just give you an example. A soldier, if they're distracted by something in their life, and in this case, it's finances, they're probably not focused on their MOS training. They're likely not focused on the unit mission. And if we send them into combat, they potentially are a danger to themselves and their brothers on their left and right. Because what we found, and you found in Iraq and Afghanistan, one of the most powerful tools against a ground IED was awareness. You're driving a convoy in the morning, nothing's on the road. That afternoon, there's a dead animal laying on the side of the road. Well, maybe it's just a dead animal, but maybe it's an animal with a couple of 155 rounds inside of it, and a guy sitting over there at a coffee shop with a cell phone. If that soldier's distracted, he might miss that animal in the afternoon. So we're trying to help we're just one little grain of sand on that big beach of all the things that you do for our soldiers. We're just trying to help with that resiliency, minimize that financial distraction. So thanks for what you guys do every day for our great Army. We're proud to be here, and we're going to recognize those installations that went above and beyond the call in the active duty campaign this year, and you'll hear more about that in a second. So, Andrew, if you'd come on up here. Good morning. On behalf of our chairman, retired General John Campbell, and the entire AER Board of Managers, we are pleased to present the following awards to the installations for their achievement of participation in the Army Emergency Relief Campaign. So for small garrison, consisting of less than 2,000 soldiers, the winner this year with 75% participation was Hunter Army Airfield. So come up, please. Thank you very much. For medium-sized garrisons consisting of less ten, between two and 10,000 soldiers, the winner with 68% participation was Fort Leonard Wood. Second year in a row. Make sure you're still smiling there, Sergeant Major. <laughs> And for large garrisons consisting of over 10,000 soldiers, the winner is Fort Jackson with 10% participation, also the second year in a row. Congratulations, thank you to all the soldiers, their garrisons, and all of you who donated. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, let's give one more round of applause for our awardees and for Lieutenant General Mason and his team who do so much for our soldiers. Thank you, sir. All of us at the Association of the United States Army greatly appreciate taking the time to share with you the wisdom and the knowledge and, the, most importantly, the support that AAR gives to our soldiers and our families. Now I have the honor of introducing the Sergeant Major of the Army for his annual initiatives brief. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, SMA Michael Grinston. Okay, uh, here it is. You know, we're putting it on the last day. So, you know, if you put this on the first day, then I'm not sure what you'd stick around for. No, I'm just joking. There's a lot of great panels, a lot of great things, but this is really where, you know, and it's not just me. I, I would, you know, all the senior enlisted council and all the, the senior star majors, here's what we've been working on, and this is what we're going to really kind of work on for the next year uh, for the Army. So this is... This is going to be good. We got some uh, things that we're going to announce. So, um, I will take questions at the end. We can do them. I don't know if we got cards, we got microphones, and we are posting things live. And we have a few experts in the room that we can call on. So, please post your questions. We've got live on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, we're doing a Q and A on Reddit. And um, I'm I'm really proud of uh, all these things that we have going on. But I really look forward to the questions at the end. So, I'll try to get through that. Um, but before we even get to any of that, we're going to do even more awards and some more things, uh, and then we'll get into the meat and bones of this. And I think we're ready for the video. We'd You know, there's actually a uh, sound to this, too. Oh, so it, it, never be too big for the small stuff. Um, and remembering the small things and knocking them out well. To be one of the first competitors is an honor. I feel great to set the example for others. I feel, I feel great to be able to go back to my unit and share my experiences with junior soldiers and other NCOs. On every single level, we've been having to refine our skills and broaden our horizons on what we need to know for each competition. So it's been a long train up to get here. Not only does it bring good representation to your unit or command, all of this training and uh, competitive nature and team spirit we've built at this competition, we can now take that back to our squad. I guess we know the answer to the who will win part. So, uh, you just saw it, kept me out here. Come on, who is something? <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, first ever best squad competition. Was that awesome or what? Okay, uh, I can't let the chief have all the fun, right? So he gets to promote everybody. That's just really cool, but uh, um, I just got to give you awards. So, uh, we still had a best NCO, and we had a, still a soldier of the year, um, but the first ever best squad. So um, somebody says, well, how is this going to work? Well, you know, somebody may rise above the other ones uh, in those individual tasks that we had in the beginning, and those that excelled in individual competencies in their in their in what we tested them on. And those are still, these two great soldiers have them come up, and then uh, we're going to give them uh, a really cool award. So come on up. Hurry up. Come on, man. You're a young guy. Run. Do something. We got to talk about stuff. We got stuff to do. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Go ahead and pub the orders. Attention all orders. Stay down. Stay out. The Meritorious Service Medal is awarded for exceptionally meritorious achievement during the 2022 Best Warrior Competition. Time, stay there. Your ability to perform under the most challenging conditions set up him apart from every soldier serving the United States Army. Commitment to the Army values, embodiment of the warrior ethos, and remarkable soldier skills okay. led to his success in the monumental event, special, 
Alvarez and Sergeant Paulson. Is highly trained and disciplined, fit, and reflects great leadership, distinct, great upon himself, the United States Forces Command, and the United States Army. Signed, James McConville, Chief of Staff. Four MSMs as a specialist. <laughs> Good. You know, if you get your uniform fixed, I'd call you a sergeant. <laughs> Fair. Okay, and not and not to be outdone, you know we gotta give awards to the, the best spot, right? Come on now. Let's go. Meritorious Service Medal for exceptionally meritorious achievement during the 2022 Army First U.S. Time. Army Best Quads Competition. Your performance while demonstrating technical and tactical proficiency at part of, as part of a highly trained, disciplined, fit, and cohesive team sets you apart from every squad in the United States Army. Your commitment to the Army and this values embody the warrior ethos and remarkable leadership skills led to the overall success of the squad in this monumental event. Signed, James McConville, Chief of Staff. Okay, one more round of applause. Look at this. Let's get a photo. Good job, man. You, Sasaki, you got to help me out, man. They're all out of uniform. Look at that. I said, you know, the Rangers go figure out how to get that rank zone on. Yeah. He's hard, man. He's hard. Okay. I'm really excited to be here with you today. We're going to talk about some things, and uh, we'll leave plenty of time for the questions on the, the crazy things that we talked about uh, here. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm going to breeze through. So if I don't get all deep into it and I don't cover your topics, uh, please feel free to ask that in the questions if we get to the end. I want to save plenty of time for that. We've had a heck of a year. There's a lot of things going on, and it's almost like we forgot that we did a couple of things, and I want to highlight this. Um, as we get into this, so uh, a couple of things that we may we've gotten done in just the last year. We completed the the Parenthood policy. We have the expert soldier badge, expert EIB badge, and EFMB badge, and that can all be done at one time. We cracked that code, and a lot of that is uh, to the 10th Mountain and uh, now Sergeant Major Retired Terranus as he helped us out with that, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And yes. We have completed the Army Combat Fitness Test. Come on now. <laughs> I mean, we've only tried to change it for 40 years. So uh, we did get that completed. And then we got a lot of things going on with quality of life. So those are just a few things we've got accomplished in this year. I'll talk maybe about a few more of those, but really what, what's in store for us for the next couple of years. Okay. Uh, number one on that priority was having the best squad competition. This is the first time we've done it. Next year, it's going to be even better. Next year, we're going to bring all the competitors here. Um, we had 12 teams. We narrowed it down to four. We only brought four forward. So the intent is for next year is that it's going to be all 12 teams. Uh, they're all going to come up, and then they'll compete, and then we'll announce that. So I want all those competitors to really realize and see uh, and be congratulated by the Army leadership, there's still only going to be one, there, you know, because winning does matter. So we're going to continue that uh, with that. The expert badge alignment, physical assessment. Um, we got the ACFT, 
And guess what? It's not going to be the ACFT. So you're going to have to take one as you get ready to go for your expert badge, expert soldier badge, expert infantry badge, expert field medical badge. But the goal is to still have one physical assessment. And one proposal, and I think that's a really good one, is going to look like this. And I've already done it. And I did this while I was at the maneuver conference. It starts off with your helmet on with your OCP boots and a vest. You're going to run a mile. After you run that mile, you're going to do 30 push-ups, hand release. You're going to do a sprint for 100 yards. Then I might get this out of order, but there's a farmer's carry. And then you have to do 16 sandbags on the platform. And after that, you're going to do a high crawl and a buddy rush. And then when you finish that, you're going to run another mile. What are your questions? You ready to go? Okay, good. So that's what we're looking at. And those are the movements that you do. You do a movement. It may not be a mile, but it's a good assessment. Uh, those, that push-up, how do you get off the ground? Those movements under fire, you're going to do a high crawl, um, low crawl, um, and a buddy rush. That's going to be in there. When you pick stuff up, you got to do that. And then um, we're just going to do another movement. So we're looking at a physical assessment, and that can inform us. So you have an Army Combat Fitness Test. If you score high on that, do you score high on this other assessment when you get those expert badges? So this could inform us for the rest of the Army on what we're doing on physical assessments. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, we, we've already got it. We've already done it. Um, we're, now we've got to figure out, is it the right time? I think the... Originally, it was 21 minutes. I don't know if it was Sergeant Major Guns in here, but I think that's uh, maybe it was 25 or 30 minutes. And uh, we're trying to figure out is what's going to be the total time do you get through those movements. And that's where we're going with the expert badge alignment. All the other tasks are already in the line. So you can do E3B. Um, and we already proved, proved that. We actually did that. We tested that at the best squad competition. And those three soldiers that went to the best squad competition and earned their EIB, they earned it uh, at Fort Bragg going through uh, the stations that we set up for the best squad. Um, so that's the physical assessment. They have not done that physical assessment, that that's where we're going in the future. The basic leader course, we're revamping it. You heard uh, TRADOC Sergeant Major talk about land, nav land navigation yesterday and why that's important bringing back land navigation, understanding how to read a map and a compass. That still is extremely important as we look for large scale combat in a degraded environment. You need to know how to navigate from one point to the next without a GPS. And that's a skill that we're gonna bring back. In the future, we're looking for field craft, bringing back a field training exercise. And we took that out of the basic leader course. We're trying to put that back in and it'll look like stations you would have some tasks, like the warrior task and battle drills. Everybody needs to understand how to do load, fire, and reduce the stop as your 240 Bravo, as an example. And some people will say, well, Sergeant Major, that's not in my skill. Okay, I understand that. Everybody, when we deploy, usually is standing behind one of those weapons. And it doesn't matter what your MOS is. So... These are the skills we're trying to bring back for every NCO, and that's the future, and that's what we're going to be working on for the next year, is how do we bring back field craft and the warrior task and battle drills into, back into the basic leader course as a check to ensure that we are still understanding those tasks. And then we're working on digital job books so that you can do all these tasks. When you do them, you can do it in a digital job book and say, I have completed this task. And the goal would be... I go in and say, oh, let's stay with load, fire, and reduce the stoppage or the 240 Bravo. So I do on my job book, I say, I've done my task. It's uploaded in the job book, and then I'm ready to test. Not get a class. I know, I'm working on it. And not get a class, not get a walkthrough. When you get to your lane for E3B, you have completed that task in the digital job book. It's already been uploaded. Your squad leader has approved that you've done that task to standard. And now you're ready to test at E3B. And it'll save us probably about 45 days of sitting out there going, oh, do it, do it, do it again, do it again. And also, we just set a set up. You go maybe four or five days, do a validation of the lane, and then do your expert badges. You go in and test and not setting it up for, you know, six, you know, three months, four months. And it takes a lot of time for the squads. With that, um, we're also still working on the My Squad app. And 
Um, we're going to drill down to this one. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Master Sergeant, there you go, Warner. Right? You got your mic. You ready to go? Okay. I gave him really good, clear guidance straight from the Army, uh, Sergeant Major Army. I said, I want to kick ass out. <laughs> okay. And they loved it, I guess. Go ahead. Start talking. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Grissom. You can come on up. My name is Master Sergeant Warner. They won't bite. My name is Master Sergeant Warner. I'm the product manager for my squad, and I have First Lieutenant Alex Wilms. He is the product designer for my squad. So what is my squad? My squad is a uh, suite of tools uh, available on personal devices. We are IL, IL4 uh, certified, and we are also a secure platform for soldiers to work on. Uh, next slide. Uh, feature set. So readiness is one of the big things that we've been working on. Readiness is embedded in the user's profile on the uh, on the my squad application, and also we're working on with mods very closely to get automated data into the readiness, so that way in the future soldiers can get 30, 60, and 90 day notifications uh, when their readiness is up. Next slide, accountability. So accountability was something that we tried out with the 101st. They asked us how quick they could concept this because they were not happy with using um, other outside source apps. So we conceptualized this in about two and a half weeks and put it into the app. And next slide. Okay, so I promise I'd be quick with this, but counseling has probably been one of the major uh, features that we've been working on. So as of today, you can actually access this right now in the MySquad app, but we've uh, pushed through the ability to initiate, conduct, sign, and export a DA4856 anywhere that your phone has signal. And then next, we're just doing calendaring and scheduling. So we tried modeling an Outlook-esque uh, experience so that you're able to go ahead and push this through and also receive notifications for it. And this is available now on the uh, on the open web. You can utilize login.gov and you can access this, create squads, issue tasks, create calendar events, do counselings, maintain accountability, and just so many more tools. There we go. Let's give him a round of applause. I mean, you know, the, uh, like he was going to have a heart attack coming up here. You guys look scary. Okay, the only the My Squad app only works if you use it. So you have to download it. You have to put it on your phone. I can't, you know, wait, you know, I can't say, oh, you got to do that. We have changed the features of this app. So we want to put all this money to a lot of things. And I said, how do we enable the squad leader uh, to have some technology on their phone that helps them enable and track readiness on their phone? I don't have to go to the oily room and do this with a laptop or something. You can put all those skills in there and you can upload it in the, on your phone. But I need your help. I need everybody in here to actually use it. If you don't use it and you don't like it, then we won't change it. If you don't use it, you know, you go, oh, it's terrible. Well, okay. Have you used it? I'm like, no. Okay, well, that's not helpful. So we really need you to go in there and start using the app, and then we'll change it. If there's a feature you want to see or something you want to do, it's not tracking and helping you out in your daily day day to day duties. Let us know. So this is the first thing that we've done to actually enable a squad leader with some technology, just to help them with all those readiness tests that doesn't tie them to a company battery training order room. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's highly trained. Some of the things we're working on with discipline. Most everybody in, under, in here knows that we're doing a monthly solution summit. And the sole, for, sole focus of that monthly meeting, and we've done this just over a year, is to ensure or get down to zero sexual assaults and zero suicides. And that's hard. And it's a tough topic. Um, but I really want to thank all the Sergeant Majors in here. We come together, and it's a really long meeting because those are really hard topics. But we bring in new ideas and ways and things that we can do, and we're trying things. If we like it, we keep it. If we don't like it, we kill it. And if it gets really good, then it comes to the Sergeant Major of the Army because I'm sitting in there, I'm sitting in the meeting. <laughs> and it comes through all the cores and the force column that say, yay, Sergeant Major, I think we need to do this for the Army. And one of those proposals is what we were talking about. If you heard the secretary yesterday at the penalty forum, if you didn't, one of those things we were talking about were annual wellness checks. That's the importance of the meeting. And I really appreciate all the SART majors uh, coming in. And for everybody here, 
If you have a great idea that something that can help us, make us better, get that up to your sergeant majors and bring it to that forum um, so that we can work. As the Army, we're working on your issues, uh, especially for those two topics. But it may not look like, smell like, taste like uh, sexual assault or suicide prevention. It may look like, I need more money for the Better Opportunity Single Soldiers Program. I need more money... Uh, for barracks. I need more money for this. Because that's true prevention. When I have a cohesive team that's highly trained, disciplined, and fit, that's part of a team. I get a great place to live. I got great food. Um, I'm going to happy. And then all those other things are going to go away in our army. And so I need your help. If you've got something with those, please get those nominated to start majors. But one of those initiatives is a leader engagement tool. Please click on that slide. What we have seen, this was championed by the 18th Airborne Corps. And I want to commend Sergeant Major Pitt. Where are you at, David? Okay. A year ago, he said, hey, I'm going to check, check the barracks. And I said, so what? <laughs> I said, okay, was it, uh, you know, I like action, you know, but I, you know, but I want results too. So he took my challenge and said, okay. I said, How do you, what are you going to do? Well, what is it doing because you're in the barracks? He said, okay, we're going to create a QR code, and you're going to go in there, and you say, you have questions and say, what does the barracks look like? Are there lights out? Or I talked to Jones while they are and I saw this. And then it gets uploaded into Vantage, and then we take the crime report and then see where crime is on the installation. And what we've seen, I think it's a 25% percent, uh, percent reduction in crime in those areas where leaders were going to check on the installations, and we can track that and prove it through the leader engagement tool. That, this is an initiative from the bottom up, and this is one of the proposals that I've made to the Department of the Army. This is what I want at every installation. When I walk in the barracks, scan the QR code. I'm here, and then what's going on? And that will inform us where are putting our resources, because what we're finding with our, our barracks, your barracks may not match what's in the system. What we're seeing is what's in the system. So your barracks, you say it's really bad, and the system says it's really good. That means I don't fund a new barracks. That's another great thing about this leader engagement tool. That is a product of the Solution Summit. Next slide. Um, responsible alcohol culture. This is one of the, the soldiers on the internet said, hey, I want it, we want this, treat us like adults. Um, and we said, well, let's try it. And I want to thank Sergeant Major Williams, where you at? He's not here, he, he's on the slide. Here's another one. Okay, Sergeant Major Blaise, Sergeant Major, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> Sigs, you're in trouble. So uh, First Armored Division said, yeah, let's give this a try. And uh, General Eisenhower said, hey, we're gonna remove the restrictions on alcohol in the barracks. I don't have alcohol restriction in my house. So, uh, you know, why would we have this in the barracks? And we're going to watch it. We're going to have leader engagement uh, to make sure that uh, we don't get any crazy and then uh, treat you like the adults. The, the key behind this is not to have you drink more alcohol. It's actually to have a very good positive alcohol culture where you don't glamorize it. It's not this taboo thing to do. It's just uh, it's okay if you drink. It's okay not to drink too, by the way, um, and not glamorize this, and that's what we're doing with that. Um, so the, we're doing a lot of work on counseling for the next year. And um, we're going to talk about one of those two initiatives. We're incentivizing positive behavior. And we've seen this. Now, we haven't taken this on as an Army, but we've seen a lot of units do this already. It's a really good initiative. And feel free to go ahead and jump on in if you like it. But it, I think it started with the 173rd in Italy, where they said, hey, if you go out and you're a soldier, and you do something positive, say you want to go scuba diving, you go scuba diving, you get 10 points. If you take your squad scuba diving, then you get 40 points. When you get 100 points, we're going to give you a day off. And that's already gone from the 173rd to the 82nd and out to the 11th Airborne Division as we spread this around. And maybe if that's something good, maybe that's something we all need to do to incentivize positive behavior in the Army. But the second one on that is the counseling. So please click on that. So what we've seen is there are bumps when SAR majors look like you're in a danger zone. And here's some of the danger zones. You can see those red marks. Uh, at the 90-day mark, you see a spike. There's actually a bigger spike at the 12-month mark and then uh, the two-month mark. 
Uh, the, and then you can see on there it says high risk uh, of investigation. Our goal is to prevent those things from happening and we're doing a targeted counseling at the 12 month month to the battalion sergeant majors. And the question a few minutes ago in the media was, you know, what does that mean for me as a soldier? Well, um, less dignity and respect behavior from a battalion sergeant major uh, means you have a better leader that understands you don't treat people this way, and then that means it's a better com uh, command culture in that battalion, and that's what it means. It's all about making sure that we provide you the absolute best leaders we have in the United States Army. And make sure, and what I don't want to do is go, okay, we give a counseling at the 11-month mark to the battalion sergeant majors, and then, you know, we see a spike at the 14th and 15th. The, mo the goal is to make sure there are no spikes. Um, and we have seen a downward trend for three years in misconduct at the sergeant major level. Next slide. Go back. Okay. Go forward. <laughs> uh, as we get through discipline and then fit. Okay. Workplace gender relations. Nope. Stay on the slides, our major. Go back. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I definitely want to close this slide with this right here. Okay, we did the workplace gender relations survey that just came out, and I read this. And I told you the monthly solution summit was something um, that we were really working on, and we want to get sexual assaults low. And then, and I do admit the reporting was a year behind us. It's October 20 to October 21, but our sexual assaults increased. Um, now, the, there is no good news in that. Um, but we saw that, and that's why we started the monthly meeting. Um, but then the survey came out. But we also saw that we did a, a prevalence survey. So prevalence was up, sexual assaults were up, and then, then there was an increase. I can tell you, you know, as an Army, for everybody, um, that's not acceptable. We have to do better. And when prevalence is up... And there's this big gap between prevalence and reporting. There's this thing that I would say about trust. And that's something we, as a non-commissioned officer, should never lose the trust of our soldiers. Again, that is unacceptable. You have to trust us. You have to talk to us. That's one of those reasons we're doing the targeted counseling. We want you to be approachable. We want you to say, I trust you. Again, the goal of the sexual assaults is to be the zero. But I don't want that because you're not reporting it. That's not the goal. The goal is to have prevalence and reporting match. That means if I were to be assaulted, I would trust that my chain of command that I can tell them. That's where we need to be, Sergeant Majors, Sergeants, Soldiers. You have to trust us. We're just like you all. We're not from, you know, some other planet in the world. We came from your hometowns, just like everybody else, and it's like, it's sometimes when this trust comes up to me, it feels like, you know, I was born in the Army. It's not true. I came from a small town in Alabama. Where did you come from? Where did you come from? Yeah, you. If you've got to point at yourself, it's absolutely you. <laughs> Where did you come from? Okay. You have to be able to approach us. We're not, we're from your hometowns. If you don't trust your NCOs and you can't trust the leadership, it's our majors, NCOs, we have to do better. Um, and then when that survey comes out, my goal is make sure that we do our absolute best. That at the bottom line, when the prevalence survey comes out, I am willing to go forward 
and talk and at least say, this happened to me and I told my NCOs and I told my chain of command. Thanks for that, Sergeant Rainier. Thanks. Okay. Now, once we get through discipline, we're going to talk about fitness. Um, we're working on uh, annual wellness techs. I uh, talked about that. Uh, and we want to improve our utilization in our Army wellness centers. We talked a little bit about this yesterday in the family forum. We talked about behavioral health. And somebody said, do we want to see everybody go seek behavioral health? I want to be very clear. When I say an annual wellness check, that is not everybody going to seek behavioral health. And I'll caveat that with, it's okay to seek behavioral health. Perfectly fine. And I talked about it before. I went to behavioral health in November of last year. I still got to be the Sergeant Major of the Army. I didn't lose my clearance. And, uh, you know, and I don't know. I, I'll let you be the judge whether I'm doing a good job or not. But I'm still here, and I still get to go to those meetings. But with the wellness check is maybe you can talk to somebody not behavioral health. The chaplains, uh, the inflex, um, and then maybe you can go just get a good old health check at the Army Wellness Center, and they can do your VO2 max. They'll put you. Do you have the right body weight? They can give you a nutrition plan. I went last November. I felt like after a couple of years of wonderful time and terrific time as a Sergeant Major Army, I needed to get another check. And believe it or not, I actually went to the wellness check, uh, wellness center. Uh, phenomenal resource. So when I say an annual wellness check, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean go behavioral health. What we don't want to do is everybody goes to behavioral health and then say this side of the room, you just go in, I don't, I don't need to see behavioral health. But we just filled up all those slots with everybody going. Okay, that's not what we want to do. There's all kinds of resources. So that's, those wellness checks are a little different and not filling up. Um, we're going to go down to the physical because I know this is the one that everybody's waiting for. Or no. At least the good news is you stop asking me questions about the Army Combat Fitness Test. Uh, but then it just rolled right into Army Body Composition. So please click on that. Okay, I'll start off with the bad news. Right now... There'll be no changes to the height and weight tables themselves. The data shows that the height and weight tables are correct. And uh, when you doubt me or question that, I brought uh, the women that have done the data to help me up, help me out with that. But uh, um, I'm just going to lead with that. So right now, uh, we are proposing no change to the height and weight tables because they're accurate, um, and, and, it, and I want to be clear on this. The height and weight tables are not designed to say you have body fat or not. It's just a screen that says, hey, let's go check something. That's all it is. There should be no angst, just like there's no worry to go to behavior health. There should be no angst if you go get taped. Okay, so raise your hand in this room if you've ever gone to height and weight and then you needed to be taped. Okay, there's a lot of sergeant majors just raise their hands. No worries. That's, so I don't want to change the height and weight tables because, yeah, I could make it. Yeah, we could change the, the weight, of course. You just carry around more body fat. That's not good for the Army. You can read that in the slide. But here's what we did. This is the largest survey that we've done on body composition that I know of, or ever. And I got a head nod, for, so yes. Um, but we did double the numbers, okay? So if there was 16% of the women in the Army, you got 34%. We didn't double it for men, so we had to take down the, the men because we had good data on that, or data. Uh, but you can see that every demographic we have in the Army, that's what that middle column is. So here's all the, that's what we have in the Army right now and then on the right side, that's who had to go through the study. So you can see that this is a really comprehensive study. Okay, and I told you about that. Uh, we could modernize uh, 600-9. Total, there are four proposed changes. Three of those I will not talk to you about today. And one I will tell you about is what I want to do that I think that we will do very quickly. 
And that is, if you score 540 on the ACFT, you will be exempt from height and weight. So I'm just looking at the table over here to see who could type the fastest. <laughs> so I just, I couldn't help it. They torture me all the time, so I had to. So 540 on the ACFT, and you would be exempt for height and weight. So there are other changes. We need more time. We're going to have to study this a little bit. Um, but we found it's kind of pretty accurate. You know, if you score there and you were to be overweight, you may not be overweight. And that's what some of the study found. So the study did a tape. You did a DEXA, which was a scan, uh, the dual X-ray absorptometry. She said that's close enough, Sergeant Major. Um, that's called a DEXA. It is the gold standard. It's accurate to 0.5% of your body fat. And I would challenge you if you go, no, I got a lot of lean muscle mass. I saw a major, I want to go lay on that DEXA. I'm like, okay, I'll take that bet. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody up here said, don't do it. It's going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to let you know right now. Um, and I am part of the study. I went in and laid on the deck and I'm like, I'm good. Now, Mr. McGurk, I was not that, I did not have that much body fat. He's like, oh, yeah, he's going to be like 25%. I'm like, it was not 25. Okay, it was 14. But my tape was 11. So I caution you with that. So we've got some things that we want to do. Like I said, there's three more recommendations we're doing out of the body fat. Uh, the first one I'm announcing right now, if you score high on that, and that's what we found. You, we scanned your body. You had a lot of lean muscle mass, and maybe you did actually bust the tape. But you scored high, 540 on your ACFT. You should be good. Um, even if you tape, you may tape over, but you score that high, then normally we wouldn't have to put you on the machine. It just makes us more accurate because you didn't have that much. Uh, you actually had a lot of meat, lean muscle mass, and for whatever reason, you just carried it in a different spot and then uh, should be good. So that's the one proposal. There are three others that we're looking to change. We just have to do another little bit of study and there's some things that we need to work on. But I can tell you, when you have more muscle mass, body fat, you are 50% more likely to have an increase in injury. That's why this is so important. We gotta make sure that uh, we get that down. There will be more changes to come uh, other than that. So thank you, thanks. No alternate events. We're not got there yet, Sergeant Major. <laughs> so, just stick with me. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Where are we at? Um, fit. We talked about the body composition in the Warrior Restaurant Centers. Go, go ahead and please uh, click on that. Um, we've done a lot of things. I want to be, I am so, where's Sergeant Major Sellers? I did it. I finally went to a defect and I could pay with my credit card. Yes, after 247 you know, years of existence in the United States Army, I went into a defect finally and used a credit card to pay for my meal. I know, we just caught up with the vendor that sh sells ice cream in DC. But we're moving in the right direction because three years ago we couldn't pay if you wanted to pay and you go in the defect with a credit card. I mean, so we got to do that. Uh, but even more importantly, we've added 16 food trucks. Meal prep program. Well, some people go, Sergeant Major, we've always had takeout. Okay, this is not takeout. Again, a great initiative started by the 18th Airborne Corps. This is, I go online. I go in for breakfast, and I want my lunch meal. And here's four options. I want, based on my app, maybe I got a My Fitness app, or you got no meal, you got some kind of fitness nutrition app, and I go, hey, Based off on how I exercise, here's how I want to fuel my body, and I want this meal. This is how many proteins, carbohydrates I want, and they'll have a meal plan for that. You order it before you get there. You go in for breakfast, and I want lunch and dinner. I grab my lunch and dinner based off my meal plan, and then if I want to go to the gym at the end of the day, and I want to work out an extra time, I don't have to spend my money because the defects closed. It'll be a container you can go back and it's going to be reutilized. We already have meal prep at locations and Sergeant Major Sellers, right after he saw the credit card issue, it's like, okay, I want meal prep in every um, warrior restaurant in the Army. So that you can have an order, a way to order it online, go to a meal, and then pick up a couple other meals 
so the soldiers can eat healthy. The, the hardest part, believe it or not, is the reusable container. But it is available at 27 locations. It's not a styrofoam bag. You grab some stuff off the line, they're dumping food in there, and then you go back to your room. It's cold and um, microwavable containers. That's the goal. Um, quality of life. We got a lot of quality of life initiatives we're working on. Please click on that. And I'll just go quickly around this. We, in the last year, the Army and DOD, we have all tenant bill of rights at every installation in the Army. Um, it was 18? Did I get it? 14, 18? 18, to, yeah, 18 tenant bill of rights. They're at every installation. It's already there. You should know that. Um, but I'm just letting you know. Um, we've done, we just published a barracks export that, that asked us all to go back and check our, our barracks. And that's in really in preparation of the facilities investment program. So I need you to check the barracks and say, here's where we're going to spend money on barracks. Does it match? If it doesn't match, then maybe we need to renovate those buildings. Okay? And that's the whole point of the XORD is to go and validate when we start doing, not we, Army Material Command, does the facilities investment plan, are we spending the money on the appropriate barracks? That's why we're going in and doing a wise on check on the barracks. PCS moves. The Secretary of Defense has announced, you know, taking care of people initiative, they've increased the dislocation allowance. They've extended the TLE, so temporary lodging has went for 14 days. And it can go up to 60 days. They're doing this so that if you cannot find a house, you do not have to pay out of pocket for the hotel room that you're staying in. You need to know that. If you go over that 14 days, ask and say, hey, I would like to extend so that you're not paying out of the pocket for that. You need to know that. It's in the memo. And then bring that up to your chain of command or NCO support channel. So if that happens, please let us know. Child care. Another thing for the Secretary of Defense, a 50% decrease on child care for child care workers in a CDC. And most people go, well, what's the big deal, Sergeant Major? Did you know that almost, not almost, 100% of the CDCs I walked in were not operating at capacity, and it was not because of the building, it was because they didn't hire enough staff. They couldn't hire enough staff, 100%. I've not walked in and said, okay, if you had all the workers, could you have more children in the facilities? Every, every facility I've walked into said yes. So I can build more buildings, but I need the staff. So that 50% discount for child care workers for their first child in the CDCs is to help us get more C people working in the CDCs. If you want to do a family child care home, we're going to give you $1,000. And then you get priority in housing when you PCS. So we need, and that helps us out for those locations. Say, Sergeant Major, I want 24-hour child care. And we go, okay, let's do it. So we tried that at Fort Sill. And we didn't have any children. So, or we didn't have enough. So it does, you know, if you got four people, you gotta turn the lights on, and then your whole building is being operated and you only have one child, it's not cost effective. It's more effective for us to give you the money and say, here are family care homes that you could take and do child care approved on the installation, and they are they can operate uh, in different hours. And those are the incentives we're doing on child care. Spouse employment, most of these uh, you've already heard of. We've been working on these for a while. But the state license reciprocity, when you move from state to state on your spouses, if they have to pay for getting a license renewed, whether they move the state to state, we would pay for that or pay uh, up to $1,000. You have to apply for it. You have to know that. And I say that because I was at pre-command course with the chief, and somebody says, if we only did that, and the chief looked at me and said, yeah, we're doing that. <laughs> so uh, if you do and you have to relicense, if your spouse is a relicense, we will reimburse $1,000. Okay? And health care. The, the Enterprise um, Exceptional Family Member Program, we've worked hard on this. We need you to register in that program. I think we have, I can't remember the exact number, uh, EFMP family members. I, I think it's over 50,000. Um, but I think we only have 
five to six thousand registered on the the, the electronic uh, exceptional family member program. It's it's a web based. You get in there and you register. You can. It's a really good tool, but you have to go in. And I think we're going to get more people as you PCS and get it in there. But it tells you what care you would have at the next location if you're going to PCS. What's available in your area? Who recommends certain doctors? It's all in there. Uh, if you have an EFMP family member, I'd ask you to all to go ahead and register for that program because maybe we need to make it better. But we need everybody using the program once again. And don't wait till you PCS. Okay, uh, quality of life. Go back, please. Um, we're doing a lot of things with talent management. Um, the step exception of policy right now, I really wanted to announce that, uh, that we don't need that exception of policy, but that's incorrect. So right now, for the next year, or until we do better at getting our soldiers to school on time, um, we're going to keep the exception of policy in place. And it may not be the whole year, I may change it next month, but right now, um, we are still struggling to get our soldiers to school before uh, it's time for them to get promoted. And the reason last year we announced this in this forum was to make sure we wanted to promote quality. Um, but we also got to get those soldiers to school. And we got a lot of work in uh, the SEC, the Senior Enlisted Council. We're going to work on this um, in the next couple months, and there'll be more to follow on step. But right now, uh, we still have the exception of policy, um, and I don't see us taking that out in, in the next three months. Um, we're looking to do an Ask EM for Marketplace. And the re what that is, is when an officer gets ready to PCS, and they say, hey, I'm getting ready to PCS, and I want to go to this location. They can go in. They say, I want to go there. The unit says, yep, you want to come here? And we accept that assignment. Um, we don't do that for the enlisted. We're looking to pilot that for the master sergeants. In other words, you can go in and say, hey, I want a PCS, and then the unit says, yes, we want to receive you in that unit for master sergeants. Um, we're looking to pilot that in the next year. And we're going to go ahead and skip down. We talked about a little bit of the counseling, um, but please click on the military, the mentorship pilots, core compass. So out of the summit, we said, how do we mentor SAR majors? Or it really was like, how do we mentor soldiers? And if you go back to the, the Chiefs Senior Leader Forum in December, they said, we don't do well with mentorship and leader development, and we need to do better. So this is one of the initiatives that we said, is that when the Sergeant Majors go to the Sergeant Majors Academy, you have people volunteer to be a mentor, and I have volunteered to be a mentor. They'll select someone, and that's the graph. We're going to do this, pilot it, and then how do we get this down to all our soldiers? We're going to start at the top and then work our way down. Uh, and we have some programs that are working down that are already at the top, but this is one we're going to work on right now. So SAR majors go, and they will select a mentor. Uh, and I volunteered to be in one of those pools. Please go back. And uh, if you're at the SAR majors academy and you're listening, you all cannot select me. I know, um, please select uh, Sergeant Major Hendricks and everybody else. No, that's not true. So all the senior Sergeant Majors have elected, uh, and if they didn't, they just did, um, <laughs> to be mentors at the Sergeant Majors Academy. Um, and then uh, please go ahead and click on the leader engagement metrics. So we talked about the targeted counseling, and here's the second pilot that we have. Uh, we talked about counseling in a lot. And what we said is, on, the, on one side, you'll see the green. Those are the positives. And then what does this look like? So we, we've done one turn at it, and Sergeant Major Haney looked at this with one of his battalion Sergeant Majors. So this is a division Sergeant Major, battalion Sergeant Major, and it says, here's the things that uh, are, are positives. Do you have high retention rates? Do you have a good participation in the better opportunity for single soldiers? Have you done your expert soldier ads? Um, how are you doing your safety? No UCMJ. And then, and then has that made an effect on the right? And this is going to be a counseling. We don't know when. Is it going to be once a year? Is it going to be every quarter? But this would be the division sergeant major to a battalion sergeant major and saying, what are the positives? And then are they having an effect on the negative? 
And the hope is the same time that battalion sergeant major would turn around with either the first sergeants and the battalion sergeant major or the platoon sergeants and have a very similar conversation. At least that's what I would do if I was battalion sergeant major. Um, I, this is not about like I gotcha. This is about learning and mentorship and saying, hey, work on these positives, they'll do better with the negatives. So this is a little bit different. We're calling the leader engagement metrics where it looks at a positive and has it have an effect on the negative as opposed to the targeted counseling. But there are two counseling initiatives that we have. Go ahead and go back. And then lastly is transitioning out of the Army. And I guess this has always been near and dear to my heart. I, you know, I've said this many times. I said everybody leaves the Army. There, there are three ways to leave the Army if you're in the Army. One of those is really bad, and two, I guess, are pretty good. Okay, you can ETS, you can PCS, or I'm sorry, you ETS, retire, or die. But you all leave the military. So any leadership out there that says, hey, you cannot go to a career skills program, be very cautious of that. Because maybe I say that when it's time for you to transition. And I'm not going to say that. So I need everybody to understand we all leave the military, and then we all need to make sure we enable our soldiers to transition. This is good for our army. We want soldiers to leave and talk good about the army. No matter how they leave the army, you all have to do it. Everybody leaves the army. So don't hinder your soldiers from taking the time to go do their career skills program, their transition program. Because when you do it, you want time to do it. And you just do the exact same thing at your location. And then I'll close with this little story about transitioning soldiers. And everybody leaves the Army. So I had a soldier about three weeks ago. Actually, his boy, well, one of his co-workers called my, my wife. A little scary. He got my wife's phone number. He got the cell phone. <laughs> so uh, that happened. He's a policeman, so I guess it makes me feel a little better. He calls, and my wife's like, do you know this guy named J.J. McClure? I'm like, Yeah. I was like, I was a staff sergeant. I'm like, well, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but I'll call him back because I chaptered J.J. McClure out of the United States Army. I mean, I did. I'm just, it's like, well, why are they calling me? This is like 30 years ago. And um, I talked to him, and he said, that was my, he's my boss, and he's talked great about you um, his whole life. I'm like, J.J.? <laughs> like, I was the devil. <laughs> um, and I literally chapter him out of the army. Um, he just got diagnosed with ALS, and I want you to call him. So how people transition matter. Are you going to be the leader, the staff sergeant, that when you chapter somebody out, they're on their deathbed, they'll call you? That's how important it is to our country when people transition. We get that right. We won't have to worry about our sessions because every person that leaves the military is going to talk well, like J.J. McClure, and I wish him all the best. So, last. And with that, uh, with that happy note, we'll open it up for questions. What do you got? Somebody's got to be first, so. All right, Esme, while we're getting questions here in the room, we'll go online from Reddit. Are there any oh, updates coming? You're going to start with an online from Reddit. Sergeant Major, please somebody stand up and ask something. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I love Reddit. Come on now. These are good. Are there any updates coming uh, to the promotion point worksheet, uh, specifically with ACFT or any other changes you'd like to see uh, before you leave? Yes. I, th I thought we already put those out. Okay. Yeah, there, uh, we made changes to the promotion point worksheet. I don't have all the numbers uh, in my head, but we reduced uh, the amount of promotion points on the promotion point worksheet for physical fitness and increased stuff like weapons qual, expert soldier badge. I think we doubled the amount of promotion points for the expert soldier badge. I think it went from 30 to 60. Yeah, you probably, you probably want to go do that now, huh? Uh, so, uh, but... We wanted to be an expert, we, uh, and we had a lot of faith in our physical fitness, but it's also really cool to know how to shoot a weapon and know how to do those uh, tasks. So we, and it was not 
the combat uh, infantry badge, combat action badge, it was on the expert badges doubled. Um, so we, we made some changes on the promotion point worksheet. That's just one or two of those. I think those are out. Um, I don't know if they've gone completely into effect. I think we had to wait till April of 20 something, but the, that should be out already. If not, uh, those are the, that's one of the, the changes we're doing a promotion point worksheet. Okay, yes, sir. And then we'll go back. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Um, excellent segue from taking a question from social media. I know the first day of the conference, there was a lot of discussion about um, social media and leaders online, but in the last two years, I've watched your office empower your staff to be online to get your message out, to get messages from the force, um, and we've worked with them to um, intervene in, in suicide uh, prevention efforts. We've uh, intervened in sexual harassment efforts and made those reportings to the command. Um, so I, I feel like it's been really important the last couple of years, um, the standard that you've set and the example that you've made, um, we have more soldiers here because of it. So how do we take this example and replicate it for leaders across the force? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. I would just say uh, I got your back. Um, and I think every NCO in here needs to say the exact same thing. Um, and it doesn't matter where I'm on social media, uh, if I'm intervening with a, a suicide, and those have been fantastic, and we, do, we have to do better. But it also means in person. We, we absolutely, and it, and, and it doesn't matter. And believe it or not, when you look this up in the Army Command Policy, it tells us to do that. Read it. It's, uh, I already looked it up. Paragraph 4-19, it says, you know, as a leader, we expect, this is written in the Army Command Policy, and if you hadn't read it, please do on paragraph 4-19, and it talks about, as a leader, you're expected to intervene on behalf of your soldiers. And then it says, in parentheses, online and in person. I mean, I got it. It's like, but it's our major. Yeah, it's our policy. I didn't print it out, just in case I forgot it. But, it, but that's what, I think we got to do that. you got to do it professionally. You know, you got to do it the right way. Um, I think I've learned my own lessons. Sometimes I did it right, sometimes I didn't do it all right. So, um, but, but we would never hesitate to intervene on behalf of our soldiers. Hopefully, in person, right? I mean... This is a true story. <laughs> and, uh, I won't tell you where it was. So uh, I was somewhere um, with one of my soldiers. And uh, one of my soldiers does not drink alcohol. And um, somebody offered him something to drink. And, you know, somebody says, well, you know, you couldn't be in my army. That's what he said to the soldier. He said, okay, that's good, because I want him in my army. I I'm going to stick up for my soldiers. I don't care where you're at. That's how, how I feel about it. Um, and and that's how, that's, that is me. I mean, that's what you get. And that's what we want you to do every day, no matter where you're at, in which venue you're at. Um, right? NCOs? We gotta, remember that we got to build that trust back? we got to be willing to do that. Uh, more importantly than online, you got to do it in person. That's what I would say to you, too, is... Um, Bottom line, we are people, and we have to talk to each other. And I get really worried when you say, well, this thing is going on over here, you know, but this thing going on over here should not, you know, override the trust you have in your squad and your unit. And I had this conversation with, well, actually, Sergeant Rainier. <laughs> Very heated conversation. I was looking at him, like, Sergeant Rainier, Sergeant Rainier, no matter what is said online, no matter what, what did I say to you yesterday? I said, no matter what, would I do this for you? You said uh, you would die. You would die for us. You would die for your squad. You said that very directly. I did. And I, I said, don't, you know, all these things are going to happen. There's going to be said. But I want you to know you're my squad and I would die for you. And I said, do you believe me? He said, yeah. That's where the trust needs to be. Um, 
It's not on the internet. It's not somebody, you know, saying stuff bad about you. Would you die for that squad mate? Would you die for your squad leader? That's all the trust we need. So sometimes I think we need to close all that stuff off. We need to intervene, and I'm not going to stop doing that, no matter what the venue is. But more importantly, when you go back to your squad, can you, do you have the same trust in your squad? And I didn't ask Sergeant Rainier, and I'm not going to ask him now. I'm afraid he was like, hell no, I wouldn't die for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, next question. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sergeant Major. <laughs> you know, you should always get worried when the front row start asking you questions. Uh, they always got really freaked out when I stand up as a Sergeant Major. Um, I am proposing that I don't have a start date. Okay, so don't walk out tomorrow and then nobody takes that away. Uh, what I want to do is roll all those initiatives up, and some of them are policy that I need to, to really work on. Uh, and some may need more study. And so uh, DMPM, uh, you know, start riding. Uh, so uh, we got to get this staff. But that, I think that's one that we can implement uh, much faster. I think it's a, it's a no cost uh, for the Army. And I think we'll get that uh, much quicker than we would anything else. So um, I don't know. But we also will see how the Internet reacts to the eruption. Um, I think that's a positive. Would you all agree? Okay. So uh, that's why we're proposing that. I'm proposing it, but I think that will go much faster than, than some of the other changes because uh, we'll have to make changes to ARs. Uh, this one, I think, will go a little bit faster. Okay? Um, you know, she's like, Sergeant Major, hold me to a date. Um, my goal is they have all four of those proposed and either implemented or started in the Army by uh, June, the summer of next year. But again, everybody remember, I don't sign that. So uh, i got to get it through everybody, but... Uh, as I've already uh, tested the waters a little bit, I think that's uh, going to go well, and we uh, look to have that as soon as possible. Okay? Good, good question. Next question. On the Internet. All right, Ms. Mayne, just for clarification, that last question uh, was referencing when the start on the 540 exemption would be, so yeah. we didn't have the microphone. Uh, SMA, from, from social media, has there been any discussion about allowing uh, a non-military spouse's career uh, way into a PCS. Yes, uh, we've uh, it, we've had this question, and I think it was more from a Department of the Army civilian's career to a PCS. Um, I don't think you know we're going to write policy. I haven't seen any proposals for policy that says my spouse's career, you know, and only I do this, but. This is what I call that other thing, other than policy, is what it's called good old-fashioned leadership. And this should come into play every day. You know, okay, what's good for your family? And I, I, I promise we've had this conversation a lot, and especially at the nominative level. It was this feeling that we were never going to ask you. If you wanted to, to be a, a nominative SAR major, it was you do it or get out. And I said, we probably should ask them, what's good for your family? Uh, they still have families. We should do that. Um, and that's the same thing. So if a spouse says, hey, I'd like to stay here, you know, can we do that? The chief of staff of the Army and I have said that for three years. It's okay to stabilize in one location. And then we still. So um, if a, but we can be creative with this, right? We still have to fill drill sergeants. And this is one of those things, we're not finished with this yet. We said, well, if I want to be a drill sergeant, go down to Fort Benning for a couple of years, but I want to go back to Fort Bragg um, or Fort Hood or JBLM, could I go be a drill sergeant for two years and come back to that location? Why not? And so that's one of those things. When we get IPSA A, you could say, hey, I like this location. It's got all the career advancement uh, that I need. I still need to fill drill sergeants. That's the number one. Drill sergeant recruiters are still the biggest draw of staff sergeants on why they PCS. 
go do that, and then go back to that unit of assignment. That comes at a cost, right? Because if we're full on staff sergeants and that's the place you always wanted to be there, and they fill that slot. Um, but those are some of the things we're trying to do to stabilize families. Um, but we don't have any policies that says, you know, your spouse's job. I think that's individual and requires a little bit of leadership. But we are working on some of those things. Okay, what else? Yes, sir, Major. SMA, um, TAP and CSP are great programs. Yeah. Uh, CSP it provides some people some phenomenal opportunities. At right now, we're at odds with losing those people and then you have vacancies and no requisitions until they're finally out of the Army. Uh, is there any movement forward on a TTHS account or putting them somewhere uh, or not counting them against you so we can fill those uh, positions? Yeah. Or letting them clear and then go into a CSP program and creating a vacancy? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, and here's why. Well, I can give you the really easy answer to that. Is that we were supposed to assess 60,000, we got to 40,000. We were supposed to have 485, we got to 462. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I mean, I could do that, but, it, you know, where am I going to get the replacement from? So, you know, in other words, I'm, I'm, you know, if I, we still need to let them go do that. It, you know, we have to, sorry, Major, we just, I'm not saying you, but everybody, we have to let them go do that. Um, and you're not going to get me to, to agree to anything else other than letting them go and transition out of the Army. Um, if I had all the people that we needed, or at least met our end strength, it would be easier to do that. But we had a TTHS account, but it, you know, if, if we're not meeting those goals, um, it wouldn't matter anyway. I mean, I could put them there, but it doesn't matter. I don't have anybody to replace it with. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying we, we need to let them go, or we won't make our assessments goals. They're going to get out and be disgruntled. Yeah, the Army just kicked me out. I have no job. And, you know, I, I don't have any money. I mean, is that the recruiter we want to be back on the street? No, absolutely not, because everybody's a recruiter. They're going to say, hey, where you been for all these years, Johnny? Well, I was in the Army, and they kicked me out. They didn't train me to do anything, and now it was terrible. Or, no, I loved it. It was awesome. I loved my job. They gave me this career skills, and I go be part of a community, and, like, okay, I want to go be part of that for a few years. Um, it's important. It's how we take care of people, not when just we receive, it's also when they leave. So I'd like to do that, um, but right now uh, we just don't have the people. I, c I couldn't even recommend that. Okay? What else? Yes, ma'am. Afternoon. In reference to your study, um, when you received your feedback from the study. I've been waiting there? all day for this right here. Nobody questioned the height and weight tables. I brought two experts with me and nobody <laughs> said anything. Was there a difference between the level of body fat within the different demographics on that chart? Okay, good. That's why I brought uh, Holly and Katie to help me answer that question. Thank you. So you might have to re repeat the question for them though. So in reference to the Army body fat composition study, um, from the results of the study, was there a difference between the demographics in reference to the level of body fat? Good question. Um, so Holly McClung, Katie Taylor, we're from USARIUM. We oversaw the study with CIMT. Um, and when we talk about the height and weight table, um, we're talking is like kind of the first layer. So as a screening tool, we saw um, it screened effectively for both men and women, and there was no difference across race, ethnicity, or race in um, how uh, accurate it was in kind of eliminating that manpower that would be required for taping. So in other words, we use the DEXA scan, which is probably a gold standard um, in the research world for body fat, um, Sergeant Major, was saying, you know, like it's it's 0.5 percent accurate. So um, we use that to kind of assess how accurate those tables were for height and weight, and we found them they're functioning just as as accurately as they should be, around 90 percent. Um, and so those that are going on to be taped either should be taped, or those that aren't shouldn't have been going on to be taped. 
Also, just to kind of further um, elaborate on that, I think to get at kind of the differences potentially in um, body fat percentages, I think our main goal with this specific study was to make sure that we had a representative sample of the entire army. So within groupings of race, race ethnicity, sex, age groups, um, we looked at um, different physical demand categories. And I think what we did well was we got a wide range of um, and representative range of different body types, different um, you know body compositions, and so I think to get at kind of the heart of what you were saying, um, as far as body fat percentage, I think what we have captured is not necessarily that one group was different over the other, but potentially that we captured um, a representative sample from each of the different groups that we had. Did, did that answer your question? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. What else? Yep, uh, SMA. Go, go, go ahead, uh, Rob. You can go to the mic over there, and then, or just stand out and yell. But uh, there's people online, um, so if somebody could grab that mic and bring it down, please. SMA, as we move forward to Army of 2030, with data analytics being pivotal in the future, what steps are being taken or are you aware of to better prepare NCOs and soldiers in regards to future POI in PME specifically in BLC and MLC to enhance our capabilities and what we can bring to the table? So as we, well, Tradox, our major. Yeah, I know you, you're like pointing. He's like, come on, raise your hand. He's like, you don't want to be. Um, so uh, let me uh, make sure I understood. Uh, in reference to data analytic, analytics, how do we get into the NCO of 2030? Make sure I kept, just give me a thumbs up or? Yes, that's a minute. OK. Um, so actually, it's two people up here for data analytics. So it's actually Army Futures Command um, and what we're doing with the cross-functional team on soldier lethality. So we're actually trying to measure soldier lethality um, from some of the wearables that we have. I think, uh, is you, Sarah, working on that too? Uh, I think it's the Master E program. So we're, we actually had uh, the best squad hooked up to these. I mean, they, we watched everything. How did they sleep? Um, were they dipping in their performance? We had them hooked, we literally had them hooked up and we monitored everything they did over the course of five to seven days. And we could see it on a screen and said, yep, here's how they're sleeping. They didn't get really good sleep, which is like, yeah, we knew that. So, uh, but there were other things. And, so, and then we measured how they could perform. And what we're trying to do in the future is say, okay, this person, they're about to you know, go down. They're not using all their cognitive ability. They probably don't want them to go on target right now. They need more sleep or they're not gonna perform as well as they should. So in the future, we're looking um, to kind of digitize how we do with our performance um, with a capability where you have a wearable that, and we can measure it over time and then give you a score on your squad uh, and say your squad's at a 10, and if you did these four things, you could get them up to a 14, or how do you get them through nutrition or sleep because they're about to do this really hard mission. And that's what we're going in the future, and, and then uh, Sergeant Major Hester, did it, is there anything I missed on, on that? Uh, no, SMA, I think you're good on with regard to mastery and wearables and, and human performance. There are other things that are happening in the uniform, human performance um, arena, but you covered that pretty good. I think the other thing to, to cover here, and I don't think it's necessarily something that's going to go into PME with regard to your question, is in places like the software factory where we're looking at data analytics, we're looking at the ability to, to code at the tactical edge, solve problems for commanders uh, at the tactical edge with regard to prototyping and with regard to talent management. So there's places that are happening. It's also happening at the uh, Artificial Intelligence Center up at Carnegie Mellon University where we're taking uh, officers, non-commissioned officers, and making them experts in, uh, uh, at that, uh, the number two school in the world with regard to um, AI. So. So there's some places. I don't think we're at a point, and I don't want to talk for Sergeant Major Hendricks, but I don't think we're at a point now where we're going to ingest that into PME. But I do think uh, the future battlefield is going to be a place where we are going to have to be able to take a look at data, data management with regard to sensors and the speed with which the battlefield is going to change. And we're going to have to have non-commissioned officers, maybe specifically um, battle staff non-commissioned officers that, are, that can take that information in quickly they can use the tools that we have to analyze it, 
and then they can give recommendations to the to the, the commander for some resource to be applied against a, a threat. So, so we're working in some spaces there to get better. Um, but I think it's going to be uh, non-commissioned officers that uh, that are um, come with some of those skills. It's also going to be non-commissioned officers that that like that arena and want to be there because we also want folks that you know want to get muddy and sweat and carry heavy things long distances and kill people. Um, but it is it is a a space in the future where we're going to have to have people that can take data, can analyze that data, and can provide uh, good recommendations to their commanders for execution. Okay. Dan, you got anything to add? No. Okay, uh, Rob. Hey, SMA, uh, someone started to make a statement about no alternate events, but we didn't follow up on that. Is something we can talk about right now or something coming in the, in the future? No, I'm just going to stand, Julie. I'll drive myself crazy thinking about it. <laughs> um, right now, we're looking at no alternate events um, for the 540 on the ACFT. It's a 540. You got to take all six events. I can wait. Good to go. Did that answer your question? No, it's good. Yep. You're just bringing the microphone back. Okay, uh, take it back out. <laughs> there you go. Now that we don't have to walk to the microphone, now we're just like, yeah. come on. We go here, here, and then we'll close it out. Yep. Good afternoon, SMA. On one of the slides, it had order of merit list unmasking, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that means. I was just curious if you were reading the slides, too. That's good. Here, come on up. We'll give you a coin for reading the slide. <laughs> You gave me one yesterday. Yes. I gave you one yesterday. Good. Then stay there. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, we we've been working on this, um, and we have the task. And I thought I've been pretty clear, but uh, we found out that the Secretary of the Army has signed an ex org that said, you know, we don't unmask, we don't tell anybody OML, so um, that just makes it more complex. So now we have to write another ex org and then run it through the Army staff to get it signed. Uh, to unmask uh, an enlisted OML. That's still my goal is to get it unmasked at some point. It's how do we manage talent if we don't know who the talent is in our formations. Um, what we talked about um, in the last year was at what level? Does, did that go to everybody? Uh, recommendation was initially is that, well, let's do it uh, for all this, but at the division level. But that comes with trust, right? I'm a very trusting person. <laughs> when that list gets out to everybody and it gets below division, then you will no longer have that trust. <laughs> but I think at some point we need to know, hey, you're on the higher OML, you know, these 10 are there. We've got to ensure that they get to school on time because they're going to get promoted. And that's what we're saying. We, and that's why we had to do some of the ETP is because we didn't know. And we're sending people down here and they were available. And, you know, and I can't even hold people accountable. They go, Sergeant Major, I don't know, I, you know. And I say, you shouldn't know, but you got to get them to school. Like, who goes to school? Like, we have to prioritize. But how do I prioritize if you don't tell me who's supposed to go? Um, so we're going to do it. Uh, so that's, just, that's, that's really high on my list uh, to get done uh, this year is kind of unmask it, all this, uh, at the division level. And not just division, because there's other people not division at the two-star level or ASCC. I think that's what we said. Okay. But good catch. Yes, Sergeant, last question. And nobody wants to bring your mic, Sergeant. Nobody, somebody stand up, grab the mic. Come on, Drill Sergeant. Good job, Drill Sergeant. Good afternoon. That's we'll give you a coin ride for this. <laughs> My name is Sergeant Walker. I'm a senior health care NCO for the 354 Civil Affairs Brigade. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's anything in the works for a soldier to be awarded the physical fitness badge for... Uh, the ACFT. Yes. Uh, we talked a lot about that. It, it's, and it might look like a 540. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we hadn't gotten there yet. Just, uh, you know, it went effective for flagging, you know, maybe 12 days ago. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, sure. I'm not against uh, doing a physical fitness badge, but, um, you know, there's some other things we're trying to work on with policy. And one of those is the body composition. We just want to get that really out and uh, make a few more changes uh, on that. And that's kind of the priority. But, yeah, we're all in for a physical fitness badge. Okay. Um, in closing, um, I do want to thank a couple groups first and foremost. Uh, if you're uh, a former Sergeant Major of the Army or we well, got SMA and, and Ken, and this is my last AUSA as uh, the Sergeant Major of the Army. 
and um, I'll be probably in the crowd in a suit, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. And to you all and being mentors for me in the last uh, three, four years, I want to say a special thanks to you all. Um, and then to really the Five Eyes, but all star majors of other countries, uh, you know, been great friends. I can say Paul and Jim, uh, special thanks to you. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I couldn't be happier with uh, everything that we've done in the last few years and the relationship we've had and uh, the torture. You've gone to, you know, 10 miles with me, ACFT, Trans Mountain Runs and all this stuff. Um, really great friends and I really appreciate your friendship and, um, and, and for everybody, all the, the Star Majors of your country, I'd say we've never fought a war alone as the United States Army and, and we're not going to do that again. Um, you know, just, you know, we're, we're stronger as a world together. Uh, one group that may not be in the room too much, I think I saw one officer in here. Um, I, there's, like, there's more than one. There's two. Uh, I don't know, did General Bonner leave? He did. But tell him I said thank you. And I say this, this is, the strength of our, our Army is our NCO Corps. We do none of that without the trust of our officers, right? They trust, they trust the chief of staff of the Army, trust me enough that I can present those awards. He trusts uh, me enough that we can do these forums like this, and I don't want to lose that trust, um, and I all want you to do the same thing. Um, so I want to do a special thanks to the officers. Um, for the NCOs of the room, I would say for... 33 years I've been a non-commissioned officer. Um, I have been extremely proud to be a non-commissioned officer. I've loved every second of it, and uh, I think my basic responsibilities are still there, whether I was a sergeant to be the sergeant major of the Army. And, and that's a long time, um, but those grounded fundamentals haven't changed, and what you've done for the Army has been uh, phenomenal. And then the, and the last group is the soldiers. Um, it really comes to what I told Sergeant Rainier is, um, you know, people say, would you do it again? And I would say, absolutely. I would die for our soldiers because they would die for our country. Um, and that's a powerful statement, um, but it's so true. I see it in their eyes and their spirit. And if you're wrong, just look at the, the front two rows over to my left. Um, and when people, and I'm going to tell you this, in my parting ways, and people say, if anybody tells you that, you know, what's going on with your generation or any of that, it's just great crap. You know, you're great, and you're going to be greater than we ever were, and don't let anybody tell you anything different. I'm proud to be your Sergeant Major of the Army, and I'm proud that you're a soldier in the United States Army. So thanks. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, SMA, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join us this evening at 1830 in the main ballroom on the third floor where we will conduct AOSA's Marshall Dinner and Presentation. And thank you for joining this year's Association of the United States Army 2020 Annual Meeting. Have a great day.